everyone matters to our loving Heavenly Father and what a heart he has for us. If you could say the bottom line of why we, we plant churches is because God loves people and he loves people so much that he took amazing an amazing risk to save them when they didn't deserve salvation and uh, we were condemned we were going to an eternity uh, that wasn't heaven because of our independent way of life and we rebelled we turned our hearts away from from God and the stories there in the beginning in Genesis where this world was made so beautiful in the and humans were made in the image of God and yet they took their freedom for granted and decided to turn their back on this loving God and his good governance and went their own way and what a mess our world has been in what a mess and as much as I I, uh, I love life and I love the Lord and I'm filled with joy over knowing Christ and knowing our Heavenly Father. Uh, a genuine Christian, I think, also has a great heartache when they see the, the suffering and the pain and the evil that's within our world. Um, and, uh, and some of the things that are taking place just, just blow your mind. Uh, but God is a God of, of great love and great tenderness and a great heart and he wants people to come to know him through the life of his son. And so we see the Father's heart, the essence of our message, the essence of the message that we proclaim here and in Christian Family Centre South can be summed up in John 3.16, which says, for God so loved the world. And as I've said, this world is, is, is pretty ugly in, at times. And uh, we get horrified when we see the sins that people commit against each other. And uh, it, it's almost un, unfathomable, uh, the things that people do to one another. Um, the, the levels of suffering, the levels of pain, the levels of evil, the, the numbers of wars that are going on right now. Uh, not just in Syria. I mean, Syria has had 500,000 men, women and children killed. For what? Nothing, just power, position, privilege. Um, you know, one family controlling a nation and wanting it to go on. It, 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 the mind boggles <laughs> when, you, when you see that. Uh, you go to, uh, to Africa, as I've been in Ghana, and Ghana's a wonderful country, beautiful country, and they have fairly stable governance. But you talk to the, the lacks that they have, and we're driving down the street in the southern, I went to the southern part, which is very poor, and um, people earn $2 a day, and that's pretty good, pretty good, $2 a day. So that means in one week, most of you earn more than what they can earn in a year. Okay, so the basic salary av average is around, I think, $700 a, uh, a, year, a week or so. I think uh, that's the basic wage, and the average wage in Australia is about $1,200 a, a week. So people, $2 a day, you think about that, how much, and they've got to live on that. Then you see areas where the rubbish, <laughs> the rubbish is piled up, and as I'm driving past, the pigs are eating the rubbish, and the children are playing on that area, and I, I took a video, I think this is just, and uh, you think, okay, and so the high level of, of uh, mortality, diseases that people die of is, is breathtaking. Uh, it's just, the, okay, and this is an advanced African country. So you just realise what, you know, the, the levels of poverty and injustice that, that, that occur there. Um, I'm driving down the road, and there's this man, half naked, on the side of the road, gesticulating and doing some weird stuff. And then, and I said to the driver, and I saw him the second day, and I said, why isn't he, he should be in hospital. I said, we've got no hospitals for the mentally ill. So there's just no services, no psychiatric services in those rural areas. So what do people do when they've got genuine mental illness where people go slip into a psychotic kind of, they live in their psychosis, they're not in contact with reality. And he goes, oh, sometimes it's in the middle of the road and trucks are, you know, so it's like, okay, yeah, it's, uh, um, it's pretty bad. I'm driving down the road, or sorry, my driver's driving, and this little 18-month-old baby crawled 
onto the side of the road. There's people everywhere. There's this baby and the car, we're going straight. I'm thinking, we would have missed the baby's head by about a metre. And I just said, and I just felt like just jumping out the car saying, where is the mother? Where's the father? What's going on here? Um, so uh, you just think, okay, what we take for granted here in Australia, we, we are an advanced country and we have a lot of things that these other countries don't have. But man, we have some problems. A dear friend of mine ended their lives um, eight years ago, terribly tormented, troubled. And uh, at that time, seven Auss Aussies a day were committing suicide. And our federal government, our state governments have been throwing money like you've got, not throwing, giving money, rightly so, to help in, in combating mental illness and suicide prevention. And hundreds of millions of dollars, perhaps billions of dollars have come in. Do you know the suicide rate now is eight people a day? It's gone up. So money can't solve that problem. The best medical services can't solve the, the spiritual problems of the emptiness in people's lives, the, the deep loneliness that people have, and the alienation they feel. They know there's something wrong. And the, the answer is not education. The answer is not better services. It's actually Jesus Christ is the only one that can fill the gap that's within. We've got a God-shaped void within. And, and so we, we've run away from God but we don't know what the answer is. And so what we do as a church and as churches, I'm echoing a bit here, guys. Could you just fix this up for me? Um, and uh, the answer is that only God can solve the problem of the human heart. Nothing else can, can solve it. And, and God has provided a way by which we can be restored back to him. And then when we have peace with him and the alienation is resolved, then we end up having internal peace in our own hearts and we can build bridges of relationship, peaceful relationships with, with our brothers and sisters in our community. So the scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave. And what did he give? His best, not just an angel. He gave us his best, his one and only son, that whoever, open to all, and you might be here today and you haven't given your life to Christ. I'm here to tell you, that you can be saved for eternity. You can live forever and ever and ever and ever. Your sins can be cancelled out and forgiven only through faith in Jesus Christ. And you're not here by accident. God has a plan for you and he wants you to live forever. Live for, you think about that, live forever. The quest, what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? The purpose of life is that we're made for God. We're made to enjoy him and to enjoy this life. But this life passes so quickly and eternal life is a reality. It's real. And uh, that's the quest of the human heart for fulfillment now and ultimately for where are we heading for eternity? Only through, through Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, and believe means put your trust in him, rely upon him, call on him. It's not just an intellectual ascent. It's to say, I need you, God. I need you, Jesus. And with all your heart, you believe in him. You'll not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So we proclaim him. So our, our mission is not to proclaim sin. Sin is real. <laughs> and uh, we can be forever shouting at the darkness of what's happening out there. But we've got to actually proclaim the source of light and life, who is Jesus Christ. We lift him up. And in fact, we can start condemning sins that we see, but they're the outward sins that we see. The Holy Spirit will convict people of inner sin, the, the inner desires that, that, that lead us away from what is right and good. And so when, when he brings conviction of sin and the root of sin is lack of trusting him, is independence then when that's broken is when we then can yield to him. So we lift him up, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit will bring conviction of sin and reveal Jesus to people as the only one who can remove their sin, that barrier between our lostness, our frailty, our sinfulness and perfection. And so God sent his son. And so when we look at Jesus and we read about him in the four gospels and how he talked to people, interacted with people, God says, you know what, I've turned up. So the, the, the whole concept of God before Jesus came was conceptual and there was written records and to help us understand. But we didn't really fully comprehend what he's like until he actually became a human being like you and me, fully human, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal son, and he walked among us and he talked and reacted and, and acted and, and, and as we read about him, how, what he said and how he treated people, the father says, that's what I'm like. Get rid of your religious notions of what I'm like. If you've had a lousy dad that has kind of tormented you and troubled you or a mother that, that's been abusive or, and, and every family is imperfect, he goes, hey, here is perfection. Jesus reveals what God the Father is like. And I tell you what, that's what won me over, is when I looked at Jesus and started reading what the Scripture said about him. But you know, as much as we read the four Gospels and we love what we read about Jesus, you still don't have a correct picture of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He hasn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. But how can you really understand love, God's love for you, just by reading what Jesus said, just by seeing how he acted and interacted? You can't unless you have a prism, and that prism is a cross. It's only through the cross of Jesus that we actually see and can comprehend the depth of that love. And that's why this next verse, Romans 5, is so fantastic. But God demonstrates. He doesn't just tell us. He doesn't just say, read a book. He doesn't say, just, just look at my son and what he said and what he did. He goes, I'm going to demonstrate how much I, I love you. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he didn't say, okay... You need to shape up before I can love you. You need to get your life together before I'll die for you. He didn't go, well, okay, I'm waiting till you repent. I'm waiting till you respond. You know, come a little bit close to me and then I might consider. That's not what, what God's love is. In spite of the ugliness and the messiness of our world, in spite of what people do to one another and how, I don't know how you, but when I, when I read about crimes and injustice, I just, I, I, it, it, it wrecks me. But I'm not a witness to all these acts that take place. God witnesses everything. All the messiness, all the sins, all the lies, all the, the acts of theft, the rapes, the murders, the abuse. And, uh, you know, like, it, it's just unbelievable what takes place. So I was talking to John and, and um, Mercy Boateng from down south. She's a school teacher. And she was telling me the number of children that are raped, the number of uncles, the number of fathers that are mucking around with their kids and there's no means of prosecuting them, there's no means of stopping it. So she's a professional, how do you do that? She says one mother saw her stepfather actually having relations, raping an eight-year-old. The mother saw it, but she's got no means of dealing with it. So here they are in this church trying to deal with unbelievable... We are far more sophisticated in how we can actually do that. But you think, the Lord sees all that. How his heart must... I mean, I, I find it hard to even take that in. But he sees every act of wickedness, every act of sin. And it hurts him a hundred times more than it hurts us. And you could say, God could say, well, oh, I just can't handle him anymore. Let me just wipe him out and start again. And he'd be just to do that. But his love found a way by which his perfect justice could be appeased. Somebody had to pay the price. Somebody had to pay the price for the wickedness of, of humanity. And God himself said, I love them so much, I'll send my finest in heaven and he will die for them. And I'm not going to wait for them to get their act together first. I'm going to show what love is. And so on a cross, he demonstrated that he loves us even in our rebellious state. Not condoning sin, not in any way. It has to be covered. And the only way it could be covered was by Jesus Christ. And so the, the cross is the bridge by which sinful humanity can walk through, through belief in Christ to experience salvation. And then we start seeing, this is how we see the depth of, of how much God loves us. The full dimensions of his love. He took the initiative. And he's always taking the initiative with us. There are people down south right now that God is taking the initiative in those suburbs. They don't even know that in 12 months' time, they're going to be with you worshipping Christ. They're far removed from God, but He's already working on them. And somehow, He's going to manoeuvre and work through your witness or through circumstances, and they're going to come to a place where they see His love as you proclaim the cross, as we proclaim the cross of Christ. 
But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a father we have. What a father. What an amazing God. Let me read this final scripture to you. Because again, you might think this is a bit too conceptual. How do, how do I make this emotional? Well, Jesus gave us an incredibly emotional story. We call it the prodigal son, but I think it's a story about the prodigal father, of a father who loves like and accepts like you've got to believe. A boy that has just done unbelievably bad things. A child that just ran amok and shamed his father and, and brought terrible reproach. And some people do that. People behave sometimes in ways that are just so wicked. And here's this dad. <laughs> Have a look at his heart. And, and Jesus is giving us this to say, this is how our father treats us because we, we're all the prodigal son. We're all the prodigal daughter. And this boy comes back to his dad. <laughs> and let's read this. It says, but while he was still a long way up, this is the sinful boy. And he's a naughty boy. I mean, he's really mucked up. Well, still a long way off, his father saw him whoa, and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. <laughs> He's running, running to the son. And he throws his arms around him and he kisses him. And the son said to the father, and this is what true repentance is. This is true. This is when, how we can, this is the doorway by which we can receive the grace and, and, and forgiveness of Christ. There's got to be some response on our part when we see the goodness of the Father. The son said to him, Dad, I've sinned against heaven. In other words, he knew that he sinned against God and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And, and the father didn't even listen to it. He goes, quick, 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 bring the best robe. Let me cover his nakedness. Put it, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, a ring of authority, sandals on his feet. Give him dignity. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. I mean, Jesus is saying, this is what the father's like. That even when that son had caused such damage to the family and, and brought such shame and reproach upon that family, when the father and the mother and the brothers could have just cut him off and said, that, that, that's, that's... But he actually as that son starts to respond back and sees the, the wickedness of his own heart, God the Father is there. And notice he doesn't actually say anything like, you've been a bad boy. Now let's, let's, let's go over all the sins that you've committed. <laughs> no, 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 no. God looks at the heart. And he says, if a person comes with genuine contrition and humility and honesty and says, God, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against other people, the Father just covers him. And that's what God does with us. Man, I'm so thankful he doesn't remember, remember all my sins. Aren't you thankful he doesn't have a book in heaven that says, okay, this is everything you've ever done wrong, Al, Cass, Bill, John Sagan? No, you've never done anything wrong. You're, too, you're so good. <laughs> I can't imagine John doing anything wrong. He's just so, such a, a good German man. No, but, but, you know, like, we'd go, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want that. There is no, there is no. There's no listing. It's all been wiped clean because the blood of Christ covers your sin, past, present, and future, if you stay connected to Jesus and keep your trust in him. Wow, isn't that something? And that's why we love to take communion because the Lord's Supper keeps reminding us of the centrality of the cross. Water baptism, and we had some water baptisms a couple of weeks ago, and Cass sent me all the videos, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm in Ghana, I wish I was here to see all those baptisms and people testifying on the Sunday night. It was a fabulous... How many got baptised? Seven. Seven people. Beautiful. So water baptism is the, is the initiatory rite of entrance into the kingdom. It speaks of, I've made a commitment to Christ, I'm prepared to follow him, and I'm going to publicly testify. The Lord's Supper is the second great ordinance. We call it an ordinance rather than a, than a sacrament because we don't see it as a means of, of grace, okay? It's a symbol of what God has already done, conversion and now our salvation. So, so the, the Lord's Supper 
is a place where we can actually take communion, is reaffirm what it's all about. That's all about Jesus, his death on a cross that saved me. And when I look at his cross, and I think, man, that's, I, I, I've received so much. It inspires me to want to take up my cross, deny self and follow him. Not to earn salvation, not to earn grace, but because grace has been extended to me, and it's, it's free grace, but it ain't cheap, it demands, it demands obedience. It demands dedication. It demands that I serve him. It means putting off my sins and saying, God, oh, this last few weeks I've sinned in my thought and desire and action. Lord, I, I, need, I need your protection. I need your forgiveness. Or there might be a habit that's, that hasn't fully broken. You say, I need your power to be able to live above the old life. I don't want the devil winning victories. Or I've got this issue in my family where I'm struggling with this person or in, in my work or in my somebody that I've got an attitude towards. I need your, your love. You've got to deny self. Take up your cross. And, and, uh, and say, okay, Lord, I, I need to let go of, of unforgiveness and resentment. I, I need you. And the cross, the, the, the communion reminds us that we need Jesus to be central and remind ourselves of what the cross accomplished for us. And so I'm going to ask the ushers right now to bring the emblems to us. So if you guys would like to do that immediately... And you prepare your hearts as the musos come and they're going to lead us in a song. You prepare your hearts before we take the, the, the Lord's Supper. If you're not a believer, I invite you to take this and use these emblems as a means by which you can say, I, I, I want to give my life to Christ. It's the Lord's table. It's not the Christian family centres. He doesn't reject anyone. He invites you. If you, want, if you want the emblems to pass by you, that's fine. But you might say, oh, I'm a sinner. I'm, I've done wrong. Precisely, you need the emblems. You need forgiveness you need cleansing you need the lord's help and so i encourage you to take these and in a few moments we'll stand and we'll take it together but center your thoughts now upon jesus his love his sacrifice his heart towards you he runs after you that's the father's heart let's sing this song as we prepare ourselves